people react in completely new and different way to pretty much everything, which is which is another incredible thing. I mean, what has caused this? Why is it, why is everybody so easily? I don't know. Maybe there is something to be said about it is this way because it is this way. It came to be this way. There is no single cause. There is no rational explanation. Um, but it is what it is, and we need to figure out a way to deal with it. We need to get out of this because it's not healthy for anyone. It is not helpful to have everybody dwelling on their victim mode, on their personal miseries, to, to turn this into a competition. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I have a very good friend, and we always joke uh, because, you know, we're really good friends, and we joke about how we can talk about anything, but one should never make us talk, put side by side the Armenian Holocaust by the Turks and the Jewish Holocaust by the Germans, His, because that's one of the things where, you know, you get, I get sucked into one side, he gets sucked into the other side, you start comparing and it's just not very healthy. Yes. And so you feel like, no, but my side suffered more. And what's the point in this sort of my side suffered more? I mean, right. Uh, but I think a lot of people get really stuck in this right now. Yeah. So I, I prefer, <laughs> as long as I have a choice, yes. uh, to see that suffering is universal. And you can't measure the quantity or the quality. I mean, it looks like you can, Yeah. but it's a waste of time that human beings... Ha we're vulnerable we experience pain but this thing of suffering is something we do we, yeah. we do with the pain and um it's part of the nature of the way that our minds work is to chew on things and try to resolve them and yeah. there's there's a point where some of that is helpful just to figure out, is there anything I can actually do yes. right now? But when you figure out, no, there's not. Like yes. from what I am doing right now, I can't do anything. We also have the capacity to let go, but our minds bring it back, bring, bring back the pattern we can decide yes. i'm not going to spend any more energy on this obsessive uh practice or obsessive thought and yet it that part of it isn't necessarily a choice like our unconscious brings that material back yes and i think it's not a sign that there's something wrong with us that yes. our mind brings it back I think it's a piece of the whole balance. Yes, I think you know? that, I know what you mean. If if the earth revolves around the sun because it's in the perfect position, you know, the balance. Yeah. The, the 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 mass of the earth and the mass of the sun and the distances, there's a some kind of um balance there that creates this orbit yeah. i think the same thing is hap happens in a certain way with what our conscious mind does and our unconscious mind does and i think our our unconscious presents material to us yes. to reckon with and how we practice reckoning with that material helps us in our orbit whatever it is we're trying to orbit around yes uh, absolutely and uh, you know it's interesting so i had a, once read a study and that really blew my mind and that you know they it's a, a little bit of a strange study so i'm not quite sure how they originally came up with it but what they would do is this, they would take people, they would take volunteers, they would take those people, they would put them into a room that contains nothing, no distraction, nothing to focus on, white walls, just a chair 
and you have the choice. You have the choice to either sit still for 15 minutes or to push a button to receive an unpleasant electric shock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, and people press a button and they Most feel that it's unpleasant and they many of them press the button again. So what, what's the meaning that you make about that? Uh, to me, that looks like, well, I mean, the way they said that, yeah. the way they read it mm -hmm. in their study, uh, is they say, well, most people seem to prefer doing something rather than nothing, even if that something is negative to them. And I think that's, that's how I would have interpreted it too. It's like yes. this in, in, innate drive to do things like this. That's not something you control. It's your natural uh, uh, sort of angle from which you look at the world. Yes. Uh, yeah. There, there could be different motivations for pressing the button. And it, it, I, would, I would say they could all be right at the same time. Like what, one motivation could be, I can't tolerate just sitting here. Yes. I've got to do something. I think that's what you're talking about. Like this drive to constantly yes. be entertained or involved or studying, learning. Um, and <clears throat> another way to look at that, I think it's, it's, it's not different. It's just a different perspective is we, we long for adventure. Yes. Like a risk. It's a part of our nature is to do risky things. And I, I think, you know, maybe physiologically that relates to the kind of uh, chemicals or molecules that our body releases when we're walking on a tightrope or jumping yeah. off a cliff into the water or yeah. whatever it is people say adrenaline but i i know there's it's a there's a lot more neurotransmitters than just yeah. you know and hormones than just those kinds of things oh, but cool. um i i think in the first case um we would prefer rather than doing nothing doing something even if it's painful I think doing nothing is painful. Yes. I think that's the suffering mm -hmm. that we need to see, to have compassion and see, well, what happens when I do nothing? Yes. And I think what happens when we do nothing is we get closer to our, this material that's in our unconsciousness, in, that's in our minds that we usually are able to keep down yes. and doing something is a way to not being connected with it. I, I, I agree. Yes. I couldn't uh, disagree less or yeah. I couldn't agree more, but yes, there is this whole aspect of Beschäftigungstherapie, the Germans call it, you know, therapy where you therapy people by making them do certain routines that are, you know, can be very simple, like, you know, putting together pens and they don't know something that, you know, can actually distract you from something. I mean, it's, it distracts it. Actually, it's a little bit like, you know, what we have with Alzheimer's disease these days. We have some mm, therapeutics, but they're all just there to do something against the symptom. Yes. Uh, you know, so it helps you in a way, but it's palliative. It's a, it's a way of dealing with the situation that is actually not resolving the situation. I think it's the same here, but di getting distracted. It may feel better in the moment, but it doesn't resolve anything. Right. So I think I think that brings us back to that that comment about the noise that's in the world. There's yeah. a lot of noise in the world. And I think that's where the noise comes from. <laughs> Everybody's doing things to distract them from what actually needs to be paid attention to. Yes. Absolutely. And so what's interesting, you know, mo most of the time of an ordinary citizen uh, of the modern world probably feels like 
I'm very busy and busy as hell. And I don't really quite know why and I don't quite know what I'm doing, but I feel really busy and stressed. I need to do more of it. And then if you actually catch yourself every now and then I do this and catch myself in the moment. So I'm walking around, running around like a chickenless head, like I like to put it. And yeah. so, you know, um, but what am I actually doing? And oftentimes you realize you run around feeling stressed and that's it, you're just running around and you're feeling stressed, but you're not actually doing anything. And <laughs> so I like that, a chickenless head. Yeah. Because it's not, you know, people say you're running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Yeah. No, you're running around like a head with their chicken cut off. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's more true. Yeah. Yes. I think it's more accurate because we are, we're stuck in our heads. <laughs> Which brings us back to the, the, the impetus for this talk, which is around feeling and thought. Yes. Which, which happens quicker, quicker. Are we feeling things or are we thinking things? Yes. And, um, and the head being like the location at, at we think of thoughts. <laughs> yes. Um, it could be the whole body. Yes. But, um, I, my take on that is, I don't know if, if feeling is quicker, but I think we become aware more quickly of a feeling we're having than the thought that's driving the feeling. Mm. But I think the thoughts, the beliefs, um, what we, what we, take as truth which are just thoughts you know our beliefs are yeah. thoughts um drive our feelings i don't know if that's true it's just a thought but yeah. <laughs> that's the way that i think about it <laughs> mm, okay it's yeah it's probably i mean it must be coupled right at the end if you think about the brain and you say, well, part of the brain is responsible for uh, the way we understand the brain, I guess, which is in itself, is sometimes you think about it from a philosophical angle, you say this in itself is of course a mute point because a system cannot understand itself. It's impossible by definition, uh, right? Because you need something bigger than the system to understand the system. And so, you know, but, as far as the brain is capable of understanding itself, uh, one might say, well, there are parts of the brain that are more responsible for feeling, and there are parts of the brain that are more responsible for abstract conscious thinking. Uh, but um, then, of course, the electrophysiological processes are very similar and often the same. It's just that the network is a different one and has been built slightly differently for a different purpose. And um, but they all have to couple. Can I ask a point of clarification? So the physiological processes of what are the same? The physiological processes, if, an, if you have a neuron that is firing, let's say in the, in the uh, prefrontal cortex, and you compare it with a neuron that is firing, I don't know, somewhere in the amygdala. Yes, they may, they will likely use, uh, they will very likely use different combinations of neurotransmitters and they'll have different structures and shape of axon and the dendrites will be different. But the physiological, the fundamental ways in which neurons fire and form networks with other neurons and interconnect and relay information and integrate inputs and process them into pass them on to the other networks around them. That is a very similar way in, uh, in the different regions of the brain. And so I think, you know, it's probably intrinsically we like to separate yes. feeling from thinking and to a degree, of course, we can. Right. But, uh, the separation is never going to be complete because feeling is a form of thinking and thinking is a form of feeling somehow. <laughs> and that, that seems to be more true. Yeah, I, I would agree. I like that. It's really, it's just two different ways of describing something that's one system. Yes. Like, like saying a certain drop of water 
is in a river. Yeah. You, it's one river, but the river isn't a thing. It's a movement yeah. of all these separate molecules. <laughs> yes. And that are going together. So is that what we are? In a sense. I mean, people like to think that there are more. Well, and in some sense we are, but in some sense it's really just a different scale, I guess, <laughs> because we don't control anything really. 